Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on the um, inaugural re-establishment of the Housing Committee. Uh, today is March 7th. We're here in um, school board room. Um, we will, I believe, be meeting in here. If it ever switches to conference room A, we will let you guys know. But because of um, scheduling, uh, we are in this room, but we want to make sure that we were able to have Zoom. Um, so I am Assistant Mayor Joe Kelly, um, here with my co-chair, uh, Councillor John Tabor, and then Councillor uh, Beth Monroe. We also, for this meeting, have City Manager Karen Kennard and um, City Attorney, I almost said Susan, but <laughs> uh, Suzanne, uh, not Susan. Susan. Susan Morrow. Susan Morrow. It's been a long time. It's not Susan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we are going to uh, start with legal um, right away. Training moment. Training moment. Training moment. And I'm told very short. So, um, which is great. So you have this um, PowerPoint that I've used in the past sort of as my outline. I don't intend to go through this in detail. Um, I think I'm just going to hit the high points. You can get lost in the minutia, the devils in the details with this. Uh, but the big picture for you to uh, appreciate at the moment, congratulations, you're now public body. So under the right to know law, there are certain rules that apply to you and how you conduct your business. And so the big takeaway is that you as a group, if there is a quorum of you, meaning majority of you gathered and you're discussing business, then that is a meeting. And any meetings that you have as, as a public body have to be noticed, have to be open to the public, have to have minutes and a record of them. So um, the overall arcing um, concern is a constitutional requirement that the public, that the uh, the uh, public's business is done in public. You are the public's business. So when you are discussing um, the business of the housing committee, um, you should be in a meeting available to the public if you have a majority or a quorum of your group. So the devil, again, is in the details. The complication here is that the right to know law was written really before they thought about email, Twitter, Facebook, and any of that. So people can uh, inadvertently get themselves into um, a bit of a tangle if you try to communicate via email with a quorum, again, a majority of your of your committee and um, try to conduct business of the committee via email. She shouldn't do because you're circumventing, you're trying to get around, sneak around the legal requirements of having an open public meeting. Um, so those are those sort of elements or requirements, forum, you're discussing business of your committee um, contemporaneously. Um, that makes it a meeting and that's what you need to avoid, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's you know, in some other social media platform or via email, um, that's what you need to avoid. So then the questions, the nitty gritty details are, well, what if we end up at a social event? Um, and there's a majority of us, is that a violation of the right to know law? Well, no, not if you're not discussing the business of the housing committee as a group contemporaneously. If, you know, so the majority of you are at this party and then, you know, you sit down and you're in a circle and you're all talking about the business of the housing, then yes, that's a problem. If you just happen to be at the same party together at the same time, and you're not talking about the housing committee, not a problem. So um, obviously, you know, 
again, the devil is in the details. There's all kinds of, but what if I did this? And what if that happened? That is the general overall um, concern that we have that our um, boards and commissions are conducting their business in public. And the other thing that you need to keep in mind is that your communications in regards to the business of the committee are public documents. They're subject to requests under the right to know law for public documents. They can be discoverable if there were ever any type of litigation that your communication involved. Um, so you need to know, again, as a public body, as a public official conducting public business, when you're, if you're gonna communicate by email about the business of the committee, that email may very well then become a public document or be open to disclosure if someone makes that request. So those are things for you to keep in mind. Now, it's not just email, it's text messages, it's anything on Facebook, on social media. Those communications, if they involve your business, are subject to right to know requests. We get a lot of right to know requests for everybody in the city, for all the city councilors, for all the boards and commissions, for all the departments. Um, and we are overrun with those types of requests. Um, so keep that in mind and be circumspect about how you communicate with each other and, um, and be careful about not gathering in a forum um, without being at a public noticed meeting. So that is the five minute. <laughs> was, Just a quick point of clarification. You keep saying quorum. If we were to meet one-on-one, -on -one, is that a violation as well? No, okay. it is not. No. And, and, you know, it does, while the overall constitutional requirement is to, to have transparency in um, the uh, public business, it's not to prevent some practical um, ability to get together and to talk about some things or to say, hey, let's have coffee and talk about what happened at the meeting last night or Let's talk about maybe at the next meeting, you could do something a little different. As long as you're not gathering as a quorum, that is the magic word, um, a quorum of the body. And right now there are 12 appointed members to this body, so a quorum is technically seven, but a quorum is a group. Yes. If you have singular discussions, people in the quorum, individual about the business you can do. If you're doing it to circumvent the requirements of the public meeting. So, um, you know, there are cases out there where um, the public body is brought together in twos, you know, and but the same conversation is happening one after the other after the other in a, in a specific attempt to avoid having to discuss this in public. Um, so if you're doing it to try to circumvent the law, then it would be a violation of the right to know law. And, and it's, you shouldn't do it. So if there's, if you want to have that discussion with everybody, do it in, a, in the meeting. I could spend a moment on that. So Susan, would it be fair to say the legal department is available as a resource should people have questions? Yes, we are. We're upstairs on the fourth floor. So, you know, um, we're happy to answer your questions. You know, call, email us uh, anytime if you have questions. Um, we're always available. And um, I will volunteer to take the minutes for this meeting, but this body should decide who the, um, the note taker is. And um, our office can assist with posting the meetings. Those have to be posted 24 hours in advance. I know through the chairs that. The intent is to meet every other week, very beginning, and then we'll space it out a little bit. But if before you leave tonight, someone volunteers or is voluntold to be the minute taker, going for it, I will take care of it tonight. And that okay. might be an example too. Whenever, in other words, don't leave early because you'll be volunteering. That's right. <laughs> but if anyone wants to put their hand up now, <laughs> yeah. very important.
Uh, there are two handouts in your packet. So Susan prepared the slides. And then there's also a one pager. It's like this. So here's a reference. I, I've always run by the rule of thumb when in when in doubt, call legal. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would I would hope that everyone on this committee, if you're in doubt, if in doubt about something, just call legal. You know, the other question that comes up a lot is what if I have a document? So you've done some research and you want to share it with the group. Could you do it in advance of the meeting? And our advice at this point is it needs to become part of your agenda. And you could do that through staff who's here from the planning part. Um, you could share whatever information you have and they can help get it into part of the published agenda. But then again, the information that you're sharing with the whole committee is also being shared. It's a great segue to introducing the staff. We have our director of planning and sustainability, Peter Britz, our planning manager, Peter Stiff, and our housing navigator, Howard Snyder. And there may be times when other resources from staff will join the committee, but it, we thought it made sense to have the four of us start things off with Susan's help. Thank you. Okay, I've been excused. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, what we would like to start with as everyone got their agenda. Our goal will be to get um, as much information out to everyone as far in advance um, as we can. Obviously, knowing that we have to have to um, post our meeting. Sorry. Okay. Um, but again, as Susan said, uh, if there's anything that anyone on this committee feels is pertinent and you want to get it to the rest of the committee, send it to staff, and that can be sent out to everyone. The same as that if there's something that you would like to add onto the agenda, um, a, a topic, a conversation point, just let us know and we can make sure that it gets on the agenda. Our goal is to have every agenda kind of look like this, time blocked out, so that we all, uh, we all are busy and I thank you all so much for coming, um, but we wanna make sure that we are using our time efficiently and wisely uh, to get to the, our end goals and objectives. Uh, so again, if there's anything that anyone in the committee or staff wants to see on the agenda, please just let us know and we'll make sure that we uh, space that out appropriately. John? Um, thank you all for coming. Some of you we've asked to join this committee. Uh, some of you have volunteered. Um, those we've recruited, we want as broad a cross-section of the city as we can get. This issue affects a lot of people. And candidly, we hear a lot. We hear a lot of emails and public comment from people who have houses, people who can afford houses. Um, many of you understand the problems of people who need housing, and it's hard to. We we try to recruit with that in mind. Uh, in terms of the council objectives. We really are concerned that if we can't have housing that middle income people in this city can afford, we won't recognize for it. The mayor has said that it's one of our top priorities as a council. Um, we've just finished the Portsmouth Listen study circles, and the message from all those volunteers who gave their time, and many of you were in those study circles, is we know the problem. We know there's not a, enough housing for the average middle-income person or family here or, or worker, and you, you need to get moved. <laughs> so we heard that loud and clear. Um, <clears throat> we're going to move at a pretty brisk pace, uh, meeting every other week to get started. Um, and tonight, our kickoff, so I think we want to hear from each of you a little bit uh, of your background, how you see the issue, and we'll just go around the table and get that. Um, and then we want to uh, talk about a little bit of the, the baseline housing data that was in the slides, and then can we come to... Uh, a goal for the number of units that are not market rate, 
but affordable to the average person, the median income, or maybe 80%. Um, and that discussion will wind up, we hope, and then we'll take public comment. But uh, I think in the interest of all getting to know one another, as we go into this crash course on housing, how we solve the problem, um, we'll go around the table and, and hear from each of you. Um, you know, this issue has been building for some time, and I'm a big believer, I think all of us are big believers, that the tougher the issue, the more you share it. And the more, the more you bring in the, the good hearts and good minds of, of everyone in enforcement. Um, and we hope that our council this term will make measurable progress in getting housing, affordable housing, into our community. So with that, um, let's hear from you. Me? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. My name is David Migridich. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Liars Bench Beer Company here in Portsmouth. Um, I'm also a resident and a homeowner. For a long time, was a renter. Um, I'm going to parrot a lot of the things that I said during the presentation for Portsmouth Listens, of which I was a part. Um, my business would not exist if I was not the beneficiary of affordable living. It was not subsidized housing, but I moved to Portsmouth at a time when you could find rent that matched my income. Um, and while it's a bit self-serving to say this, I believe firmly that our business is a community hub. Um, and I am also intimately familiar with the struggles of our workforce to find adequate housing um, and the ways in which they're being pushed further and further out of the city, the dramatic impact that that will have on businesses as a whole, especially smaller ones, smaller budgets. Thank you. I'm pretty sure most of my neighbor. <laughs> we're good hanging out there as long as not seven. Yeah. 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 We have tables that are mostly six, so we should be fine. I'm Beth Moreau. I am Sorry. a city councilor. I think I don't know that there's many people in this room that don't know who I am. Um, <clears throat> I also sit on the planning board and the planning city council rep on the planning board. So my expertise to this is dealing with different aspects as a real estate attorney and as a person who's dealt with zoning for the last 10, 11 years. So I don't really know what else to say. That's it. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. My name is Byron Matto. Um, I guess I'm the school board uh, representative on this committee. I'm on the course of school board. It's so my first uh, term doing that. Um, so learning on that hat, learning on this hat. Um, but more broadly, have been passionate and involved in the housing discussion in the city um, in recent years. Uh, not a long-term resident, I suppose. I was a local relative, moved here in 2013 um, at a time when, yeah, you could buy a house, rent a house. Um, so fortunate in that regard. Um, uh, professionally, I'm a software engineer, so uh, work on like large uh, complex systems. And so how that applies to um, you know, our zoning laws and uh, how, how we plan our communities, um, I think is interesting. Um, and then on the word community, to John's earlier point around, um, we'll recognize Portsmouth um, if there's not measurable progress in this uh, endeavor. I think community is uh, so critical in so many ways. I think um, from that school board lens, looking at things like um, the mental health of our students, the mental health of the folks in our uh, city, I think as communities erode because um, the dynamic nature of the city and the people within them uh, breaks down. I think there's like a, there's a, quite a, a downstream effect of that. So it's really critical and I'm very passionate about it. I'm happy to be here with you all. Yeah. Hi there, um, my name is Mary Lowe. Um, I'm here because I care greatly about bringing more affordable housing to our community um, and helping to establish or preserve the economic diversity that exists here currently. Um, I am a, I was a long-term renter until uh, recently by marriage. I started owning a house um, and that house was purchased at a time when Portsmouth had a bit of a different 
um, housing market. Um, so in that way, I've benefited from some of the past. Um, I live in the Panaway neighbor, Panaway uh, Manor neighborhood, and so that is also part of my drive to help um, support um, any sort of solutions in town, um, especially adjacent to where I live. Um, I work downtown at a cafe, uh, at a coffee shop cafe, and previously um, I worked in sustainability, um, where I led a lot of initiatives looking at um, transit-oriented development to an extent, and also um, decarbonizing road transport in the urban environment. So I've had a, a couple jumps recently. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Tracy Kozak, um, I lived in Portsmouth for 30 years, first as a renter, then as a homeowner. I'm one of the few that have a legally permitted ADU in Portsmouth. <laughs> um, we've used it for Brandy Flats mostly, but also for kids or um, work from home during COVID. It's very flexible, it's great. Uh, I'm an architect in town. I am a principal at Arcove Architects. I design housing of all shapes and sizes across all stratifications of society. I've been doing it for 30 years. Um, what else? I chair the um, New Hampshire Committee on the Environment for the American Institute of Architects in New Hampshire. We're focused on reducing not just the first cost of housing, but uh, operational costs. So energy and transportation. Um, I was previously a vice chair of the HTC for eight years. And so I know some of the um, challenges um, in the historic district, particularly uh, relate to uh, the sensitivity we need for massing and um, style and components of construction. Thank you, Tracy. Howard, maybe you're Background. Uh, background. Uh, I have a bachelor's in landscape architecture and a master's from NYU's school, Wagner School of Public Policy. And for my professional career, I've been seeking to make positive community changes through both design, <clears throat> excuse me, and policy. Uh, and I bring that into this role as housing navigator to try to improve the community. Uh, in terms of housing, both through the policy and design as much as possible. Let's go down the line. Peter, yeah. uh, Peter Stedden, I'm the planning manager here. I've been here about seven years, but I live in Kittery. And I'm here to help this committee with through to get through the zoning <laughs> and in any way that you can be helpful. So it's a yeah. slim volume of zoning. It's a slim volume. That's the that's yeah. <laughs> Peter. I'm Peter Britz. I'm the director of planning and sustainability. I have been for a little over a year. Um, I've been to the city for 23 years, um, mostly with environmental and sustainability issues. I hope to bring that sustainability approach into the housing um, and continue to work on efforts with housing as we've done for the last few years, at least, um, bringing more workforce housing and housing in general into the city and helping with zoning. Changes needed for that. Thank you. Eric. Eric, my name is Eric Anderson. Um, retired, recently retired. Uh, and, pardon me. Congratulations. Well, <laughs> and um, you know, my interest in this is just to know the need for the for, for a house, an affordable house. I I live in Panaway Manor. Um, my interest peaked with um, the fact that. Panway, which is on the agenda, um, or Sherman School, which is on the agenda and adjacent to Panway, was, you know, was a primary site for whatever's going to take place. That's where my focus of interest is. But I'm ready to learn about some of the other, you know, components of this need and um, develop them as, the, as we see fit. Great. Thanks, Eric. John? Uh, my name is John O'Leary. Um, I'll start off by saying that I'm uh, a Portsmouth native, so I've seen housing through the whole gamut. Um, I went through Portsmouth High School, uh, and I spent eight years on the city council. Seems like a lifetime ago, but uh, so I've been involved in most of this type of stuff. 
I, it's kind of interesting because you know I have some I have a whole lot of questions. I that's what I do is I ask questions because that's the only way you learn things is to ask questions and get answers and move forward. So before the night's over, I'd like to at least kind of go through that list. But at this point, I just want to talk about the fact is that you know one of the things most people one of the things I do want to get an idea of is what people think about what is affordable housing. And one of the reasons I say that is that right now, I think the emphasis is on rentals. Um, but affordable housing is also the purchasing of homes. And you know, people have spoken to it. Uh, I was on the council when we instituted the uh, Portsmouth First Time Home Buyer Program. And you know, that certainly, uh, you know, part of the picture, but not part of the picture that people have been talking about. But I also, I want to take some time as we go through this process to concentrate on that. Um, since I got off the city council, I've been involved in other things. Um, just before I left the city council, Mayor Eileen Foley asked me if I'd serve on a library study committee. That ended up 14 years later in building a library. Um, I was chairman of the library building committee. I've also served on the uh, committee that built the uh, Boundary Place Garage. And right now I'm serving with Councilor Tabor on the uh, Community Policing Facilities <laughs> Working Group. So I've been involved in a lot of things. Um, as I say, I it's kind of interesting when I hear all the people from Panaway. I think there was at one point in time I knew almost every other person in Panaway because they either went to high school with me or St. Pat's with me. So, um, you know, I I bring a lot of history in the city, and I'm happy to share that if that's helpful, to, you know, with others. Um, as I say, I, getting back to Eric, I am retired. Um, in my retirement, part of my retirement, I spent six or seven years subbing at Portsmouth High School. Um, I would average about 120 days a year at the high school. So I got to know a lot of the kids. And so I have a little flavor of not only the old people that I grew up with, but the young kids that are floating around now. So again, I'm happy to be with you and I'm happy to hear what you have to contribute. And hopefully I can do the same. So thank you. We have Megan for a second. Do you want to introduce yourself? Megan, you're you're still muted. Hold on. Unmute yourself. Oh, we're waiting for Megan. We'll yep. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize. I have pretty weird laryngitis. So sorry, I don't always sound like this. Um, You're coming I mean, through loud. Oh, good. Yeah. My name's Jen. I am a Portsmouth resident. I also have three little kids. The oldest of whom is a first grader over at Little Harbor School. Um, in my full time job, I'm a real estate developer. Um, part of the group that owns three of the hotels downtown. Um, I also, my family owns Grocon Construction, which does a lot of the construction work around the seacoast. Um, so I really come at this issue with developer's lens, and I'm excited to sort of share that perspective, which I think is important for this conversation. Um, maybe not always the loudest voice in these types of conversations, but uh, again, I think it's important. Um, I also, as a business owner, you know, it's different than Liar's Bench, but when I go out and I'm trying to develop out at Peas or looking at a new building somewhere, one of the first questions that tenants ask me is, well, where are my people going to live? And I feel that pressure really strongly in, on all aspects of my life. So um, yeah, I'm excited to be here with you all. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Karen Conard, city manager. I took this job in December of 2019. And so I'm in my fifth year. I moved to Portsmouth with my family in July of 2020. I'm pleased to be here. And I will share the assistant mayor's role as taskmaster. I'm going to try and keep us 
to the agenda uh, for time selfishly because my daughters are turning 25 and I have a dinner to go to. Um, are, we, are we able to get Megan? I see, there she is. Hello from Nashville. Hi, Megan. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, I'm so sorry I'm not there in person. I'm en route back home, though. Um, but I am really excited to serve in this capacity. I've been looking for an opportunity to um, give back to my community, so I'm very excited to be a part of this committee. Um, I am a lifelong resident of Portsmouth. Um, I have young children who I hope will be here um, for a while too. Um, and I also live in Panaway, so I definitely have an interest um, in what's going on in the neighborhood, but also I'm looking forward to creating kind of sustainable solutions um, citywide. So I'm glad to be a part of it. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone. You guys know Joan, Joe and John. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very good. I moved this on to the agenda. We'll soon go back. Perfect. No, I think yeah. that's good. Well, we still have to decide who the secretary is. I love it. <laughs> oh, love it. we're listening. Are you volunteering? <laughs> is there anyone so far that would like to volunteer? We'll double the pay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, get, we'll double the pay. I'll think we'll get them for next week. Um, maybe we should just briefly cover some yeah. of these considerations. Um, Children, yeah, so um, as we all saw in the agenda, um, you know, there's there's three top things that we want to want to really focus on in this in this group. I mean, we want to make it very clear that this group is not just for uh, the the consideration of the redevelopment of Sherburne School. Uh, we are looking to really try to tackle housing on on in multiple fields, uh, as John said. You know, looking at the uh, first time home buyers program. Uh, obviously, we all know Sherburne School Redevelopment is at kind of the top tier of this list. Uh, the other um, things that we want to talk about are the establishment and or discussion of the housing trust um, and a payment in lieu uh, mechanism that is done in other communities to help fund a housing trust that can be used to build affordable housing. Um, and then really looking at zoning incentives, which we're going to touch on some more uh, as Councilman Monroe and as the um, the land use um, committee really worked on some zoning that is going through uh, the planning board process and approvals. Um, and then looking at where um, within our community could um, density fit, where can we look at um, building more housing? Um, and we'll discuss, as, as was touched on, what is affordable housing, right? Because I think it's very important that this group walk away. Also, in my in my world, we walk away here as um, whether you want to, if you'd like to, as an advocate for um, housing of all different types, uh, but also as a sharer of education. We will also be bringing in some speakers, um, you know, to educate this group so that we can go out in the community and educate the community constantly. We're we're heard, you know, who can afford this or who can afford that. Um, it's the reality of what our median income looks like in our community now um, and, and what, how much housing stock we have, where are we building it, why can't another neighborhood build it or another city or another town, kind of what our responsibility role is. And so we hope to have someone from the Rockingham Planning Commission, um, you know, the Seacoast uh, Workforce Housing Coalition uh, and other speakers uh, from our community. We have a really great in-depth community here uh, in Portsmouth of engineers and architects and uh, people in, in their own independent working groups that will be inviting. Uh, obviously, one of the things we made sure to do too is public comment uh, and so bringing in people. So that this also has a element of education um, from within this group, from ourselves, but also bringing in outside people. And so those are the three things that we're really gonna try to work on developing a work plan on how we're gonna tackle those three. Um, again, as was touched on, our goal will be to meet every other week uh, and then potentially disperse into some working groups and then kind of come back to monthly meetings. Uh, but I, again, I want to advance. Thank you guys all so much for being here and committing to at least the first couple months every other Thursday. Uh, I know it's a lot for everyone. And I just want to, it's exciting to me to have people who are architects, developers, Younger people who are closer to the affordability questions. You know, I think 
with housing over the years, it's always been yes, but, or if we could do this, yes, but, and there's actually yes, and. Um, you know, I was, there, there's developments of small houses, 850 square feet that are happening around the country, even in Dover. Dover. And, you know, the developer was told, nobody's going to buy a house that small. His investors doubled them. So that's a yes and. and I think when we talk about zoning and setups and where can density be achieved, those are the kind of creative solutions that we want, want to tease out. Also, um, one of the things I would have added in this too, and I'm just thinking about this now, is what does density look like? Because I think a lot of times when we, when we hear a lot of pushback, at least from the city council, density, where people are saying, we don't want five story, six story, 10 story buildings. But I always come back to a place that I lived for years, Atlantic Heights. With given our current zoning, we could not build Atlantic Heights. It's a highly dense area, and units ranging from 600 to the biggest being 800 and you know 900 square feet. Some of the homes, obviously, additions and things. But I lived in 630 square feet with a roommate for five years, uh, and so looking at con having those types of conversations uh, and making sure that we have. We're, we're being really truthfully honest with ourselves and sitting in some of the discomfort that this group is going to bring ideally to ourselves and to the community of what is what really does density look like what can we do uh and again where can we achieve it so you know, making sure that we're really kind of getting to the nitty-gritty and so in advance thank you housing staff for answering all of our zoning questions <laughs> okay and the work you, we know you will do <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just jump into the yeah so um this is a little bit of where we are right now, and this perhaps will focus us. Over the last seven years, um, not that we aren't building out, um, 1,810 new units in seven years, and that's both rental and for ownership. That's that's approved or built? Approved, permit. Okay, permit. Yes. Just an important distinction. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, as you see, uh, 1,137 of that's awaiting construction. Yes. And then there's some that's under appeal. Uh, so the, the big spike, 664, was West End Yards. Um, but that gives you a sense of, of the pace at which housing is happening. Um, but next slide. How much of that is affordable? Uh, we know the typical rent. Uh, at West End Yards is $3,500 a month. Um, and to get into how many people can afford that. We know that the um, a condo is typically half a million, $650,000. Of that 1,810 units, only 9.2%, only 167 units over seven years is what we would call before. Now, our definition, the definition I'm using in this slide deck is the work <laughs> housing definition under New Hampshire statute. For rent, that's 80% of the median income. For owning, that's 100%. And that's later in the slide. Um, and, you know, I think some of us who have been watching this are, are happy that these little experiments did work. There's 35 million views. But the pace of those has been very, very slow. Council Moreau and the Land Use Committee dove into that, tried to streamline it, did streamline it. We're in the process of developing an ADU handbook to um, make that simple. Um, we had our first micro house that's happening downtown. Um, and then we had workforce housing that we induced developers to put into their project like Cinemagic, uh, where we would give them an extra story in exchange for some work for this house. I think it's also very important, uh, as I'm sure everyone in this room, this room knows, but for people at home or people who are going to watch this later, New Hampshire does not allow us to mandate housing uh, or affordable uh, affordable units uh, in, 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 in any circumstance right now. It has been tried in other communities, and that is under litigation. Uh, I do think it's important to know that in a lot of states that require mandated uh, homes, it's, uh, I'm sorry, mandated units, affordable units, uh, it's about 10%. So if we actually look at kind of the, you know, we're at 9% without any mandatory inclusionary housing. 
So I think, you know, that is a, a, a good, a somewhat good sign is we're kind of different rate at some of the areas uh, that do require the that 10% uh, mandatory inclusionary housing. Quick and question. Yes, uh, you, you said you've induced uh, developers to include uh, affordable housing in their developments. Is that something that is they're legally bound by, or are yes. they of, okay? It's incentives. It's incentives. It's incentives, but if they do it and they decide to change their mind, it's a long term. Okay. We call what, what I was always uh, taught by uh, this this term that Nick Cracknell used to say is, is carrot, the carrot and the stick. You know what I mean? So we want, they want something. Well, we want something in exchange. And it used to be, um, it not used to be, there are some some differences, and I would come back or we're planning to uh, talk about this. Um, so we used to say like community space or yeah. downtown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, downtown is a good example. It used to be community space or affordable housing. And one of the things that we're trying to do is take away that or. Um, it's now an and. It's, right. and, and change it with the and. That was a big part of the land use uh, and planning and stuff. But the thing yeah. is, biggest power. I, I just want to, to add a little twist onto that. Maybe <clears throat> it, it, it will help, and certainly not trying to confuse. The, and, and Joanne touched upon it. It's the carrot and the stick. There, there's the, the carrot being incentives, and through incentives, um, the, it's it's a type of negotiation of, of, of sorts where the city and the developer get together and they understand uh what that carrot is is going to be and so then they enter into an agreement through a review process or, or development agreement and things like that that bonuses will be given and it, as long as there's an effort to um uh to develop more uh in, in community space being one of the incentives and there's a transition that will be going on uh through what was discussed about uh, what that carrot is, as, as you spoke to. But I wanted to add into that something important that you might have just said, and that was uh, the state of New Hampshire does not allow inclusionary, which would be you must and you shall do. Uh, and so there, there's a big difference. Some people have, have spoken about the state of Massachusetts, which allows for inclusionary. Um, and it's important to make the the, the difference between um, incentives, the carrot, and inclusionary, which in some ways removes the carrot and, and just the stick. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and yeah. Brings it's, it's, stick. it's also important to note that um, even if we say change uh, everything in, in the law change in New Hampshire that we could force inclusionary housing, once projects are permitted, they are permitted at what the statute was. Or, or what they're allowed. It, it's actually the first public hearing in front of the planning board for any project vests into the zoning as it was on that date. And so as long as it moves forward in the process mm -hmm. and keeps get permitted and gets approved and all that, it gets to use that zone. But I don't think New Hampshire wants to be Massachusetts. Oh. Eric. <laughs> <laughs> With those contractual or arrangements with the developer to have a percentage of the development of housing or affordable housing. I think I'd like to know if there's a distinction between those two terms. Um, is that is that permanent or does it after so many years does it does that evaporate and it turns into market rate housing where they they met the condition on the initial construction but after time it, it evaporates. We, Peter do you want to yeah it's enforced through a covenant with the with the developer and the covenant is set at the Time of the approval of the planning board. So there's different terms, 30 years, 50 years, depending on whatever that was set at the planning board. And that covenant is enforced through the, every year. They make sure that, that that is met. But there is a timeline to it, generally. So there's generally a yes. timeline. Yeah, it has a sense. Yeah. And I'll just add to that. So that's with private development. So the Portsmouth Housing Authority is perpetually, but these are truly workforce housing units that we're talking about right now. When you talk about true affordability, that's someone's ability to spend 30% of their income 
on a house, right? So what we need is not just workforce housing units, but we need market affordability as well. We need so that everybody at every income can afford to either buy or rent based off of their sizing. But doesn't doesn't PHA housing doesn't that have a component of transition at at, at certain timing at a certain timing? They have to qualify. So they're truly workforce housing. It's truly either low income housing or it's workforce housing. So they have certain conditions and qualifications in order to live in their housing. And that leads us to the, the Portsmouth Housing Authority. You notice that the biggest single chunk of affordable units that we've done in the city has been the PHA project on Court Street. Um, it, and I don't know if any of you have been to Griffin Place. Um, it's workforce housing. I would be happy to have my kids living in it. It's, it's a very nice building. And it's got a waiting list all the time. Now, so the two takeaways are, yes, we're building housing. Most of it's at market rate. We've managed to get this small number, 167 units, or 9% over the last seven years. and. The reality is the demand for market rate continues to be really strong. <laughs> so as, as one of the uh, people involved in the PHA's study said, if Portsmouth built 2,000 units, demand is so strong, it would all sell at market rate. Sure. So there is a little bit of uh, the step-up effect that a new $3,500 a month apartments happen or new condos happen. People move out of Union Street and Cabot Street, sort of the Class B rentals, but but um, not much, not much. Next. Yeah, I, I'm just going to. Um, so to that point, John, on like the there's um, in my mind like it's the what, what I call a burn down chart in terms of you know there's number of houses being or units being built. And then there's housing needs. We get these housing studies, so like the 2022 PHA study, and it had like the number 2,000 units. Um, and then there's units approved. It'd be really interesting. I don't know if this can be helpful to staff or somebody. Uh, this is just something I'm wishing I could see. Is that burn down is, is over time? What is the needs gap comparatively to sort of what we're building? Because I think looking at them separately is difficult to conceptualize sort of what the actual progress is. Yeah, and I think. We all know intuitively that the need is for somebody in their 20s, 30s, who's not coming here with a giant income, but you know, maybe is in a profession like a teacher or uh, a daycare provider or an artist or uh, works in the service industry downtown. That housing is drying up. Yeah. Wouldn't you? Could yeah. you argue that it's not just twenties and thirties; it's the whole age spectrum. Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm maybe oh, stereotyping. Yeah. Way too much. Um, There's a lot of conversation about what people wanting to age in place, not necessarily in that home, but in that community, and we have they have nowhere to go. Therefore, that turnover that you would see, right? That your your grandmother would would move into a smaller you know, condo, and then you would buy that home or that, that neighborhood turnover mm -hmm. you'd see, you're not seeing as much because that demographic. I, I'm in Maple Haven and we have a, a large older demographic there that has been there for 40, 50 years that are looking to move somewhere else, but there's nowhere else for them to go. And therefore, a lot of times, as we discussed, those first time homeowners, that barrier to entry of first time home ownership is huge. And as we get into discussing uh, down the line, the um, first-time homebuyer program, you no longer can use that program on a on the cost of a home in Portsmouth due to qualification. So I agree with you that there's a lot of issues that, and this is the discussion period, guys. Don't don't think we can't just chime in and talk. This yeah. is this is that forty-five minute discussion period. <laughs> I, had a thought. The, I was gonna. I was interested. In, you mentioned before, Peter, the uh, enforcement of the covenants on. I'm just out of curiosity, what does that enforcement look like? So how, how is the yeah. So it's it's really overseen by the bunch of housing authorities. So the company gets put in place and the housing authority, you know, follows up with the office. 
they, 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 do, violation, they, they do an annual certification to make sure that those units are still. So the workforce housing that for instance in the magic enforcement housing authority had authority on enforcement covenants that are there. That's that's different. Those are for sale, so those are deed restricted. Right. Okay. Those are going to be deed restricted for fifty years to be only be able to have so much. Um, you can only make so much money when you go and sell. Okay. But that still has to be enforced. <clears throat> yeah. Enforcement housing authority does the enforcement. Okay. Same West End Yards. Okay. Thank you. Can I just ask that when you said you can only make so much money when you sell, mm -hmm. explain that to someone. So, so workforce housing for sale units are basically your, <clears throat> and I can't remember what percentage is, but <clears throat> you bought it for 400000 you can't sell it for more than X dollars based off of your time there. I believe the time, time and interest, I forget how we Okay. How it's but thank you for that. Yeah, it's, I wasn't aware that that was out there. Well, that's, you. you can have for sale or for rent. This will right. be our first delve into actually having for sale workforce housing units at Cinemagic. They're giving us 20% of their units. Okay, good. Thank you. So if, if I can add to that, John, it, in, in fact, it has the, the legal background to it. But when, when you're talking about a, a deed restriction, it's, it's filed and right. registered Regist in the, the conditions of it will be there. It's not a consistent 10% or 5%. Right. It, so uh, each one's a little bit different, but the idea is that they're all, uh, when it's subject to that covenant, that it will only be allowed a certain percentage of increased value. It, it may be 10% or 5% per year, but they could sell it at market rate, but they certainly can't sell it at, at something that would be lost. And the other thing, you know, I, again, Having thought about this whole thing, you know, that's one of the things that <laughs> I've thought about is the fact is that through the first time home buyer program, we help people buy a house. And then 10 years later, 15 years later, they sell it and double their money. I mean, you know, is there a way, is there a mechanism to allow the city to uh, city community to share in that profit? because of the fact that you gave them a loan for free. Uh, I'll give you a quick story. There was a fellow in town, I won't go through all the details, but he sold a piece of property to somebody at a price that was less than he wanted, but that's what they negotiated. And he said, on one condition, when you sell that property, 25% of the money you make on that goes to the futures program, your enforcement. Person sold the property, Gave the futures a check for 25% of their profit, if you will. I would like to explore a program where if somebody sells at a significant profit after participating in one of these programs, the money comes back and becomes part of this trust or whatever it is to help future people. So, anyways, that's yeah. just an idea. Yeah, we can watch out. You may be a working group. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I just want to add on to that, John. Uh, when I was uh, a community and town planner in, in Massachusetts, there was an established affordable housing trust, and the, the funding mechanism for that trust was through various different um, taxation or, or the Lua payments and grants and things like that. One thing that they were working to develop is similar to what you just spoke of, where and it was it alluded to where no longer is the first time home buyer program able to provide a substantial enough amount of money for, for the down payment. So what occurred in this community was the, the idea that, well, we could be in an investment of sorts. We could come up with assistance on the 10%, but when you go to sell that, whether it be four or five years, we get that 10% back plus whatever Revenue is also increased through the, the increased okay. value. Perfect. And that comes right back. And that will be, like you said, on our, well, it's not on the top three, as we've discussed. <laughs> you know, it is a goal of this committee to look at. And I know that there's some city uh, conversations on, and staff level about looking at that program and trying to, to yeah. revitalize it. Yeah. And think about how many homes could become within reach that aren't within reach now. Yeah, because, you know, they, I mean, it's a, 
it's a very good program, um, but like most, uh, but a lot of programs, they stay in place and, and need to be adjusted to reflect today's market. Correct me if I'm wrong, that, that program requires a certain group of residency. Yeah, to that's one of the things, you know, it's kind of interesting, you know, again, I've heard comments, I, I heard the mayor say, I heard somebody say, you know, the people from Portsmouth, we want them to be able to stay here if they want to. Um, what that program, I'll give you, you know, my, my, it's available to people who are residents of Portsmouth or work for the city. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious about, there are, I, I know plenty of individuals who have been forced to leave the city, but who could show proof of residency for 10 plus years, and now they're no longer able to access that program. That's correct. And they were they're the very types of people who have been, you know, suffering the consequences of living in such an affluent city. You know, I think that the program is well designed in that regard, and the fact is that we don't want to create a program that benefits somebody who's frankly, living in Farmington that wants to move to Portsmouth. That's not the, that's not the idea. But is there leeway for someone who lived in Portsmouth for 15 years and then had to move to Farmington last year? Yeah, again, those yeah, are the things that can be looked yeah. at. But, you know, again, there has to be a criteria. The criteria right now, and I don't remember exactly, they have to have lived in Portsmouth for two years or whatever the number is, or be, or be a city employee. So, yeah. And again, that's you know that was what the direction was at that point in time. Yeah. Can it be you know looked at? And again, you know somebody who lived in for X number of years and has been gone for X number of years, certainly. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the most shocking statistics that came out of Portsmouth listens for me was that I think we have 0.1 percent vacancy. Mm -hmm. so oh yeah, it's you, very. If you're you know in, in a, we're, we're under one. Yeah, a healthy market is about five to six. A normal, healthy rental market has a 6% vacancy rate. The city of Portsmouth has a vacancy rate that's that's currently under 1%. Yeah. So if nothing comes, it, hypothetically, if, if nothing else came into the rental market, uh, all the available inventory that, that's available would be gone. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I can and give that... you real world examples of people who, the housing, the, their rental sold, and they could not find anything. Sure. The, the whole area of finance is a rich area. Finance, zoning, these all work together. Um, the city manager is giving me the Yes. <laughs> I think one of the things that if, if this group would be interested in is we could send around to, uh, as we're talking about comparisons and, and what are certain things to look like, and somebody mentioned like how many units um, would be the um, Rockingham, um, what is it, the housing, the Rockingham Planning, Rockingham Commission. Planning Commission. Yeah. I, yes, I, yeah, the vice yeah. chair. So, so join us, <laughs> just, just quickly, and, and you know, no, you know no, uh, I, I, the, the Carol Burnett here to, uh, the, on the city's website, there was established, and it's gonna be moved around more, but, but there's an availability on the city's website uh, uh, if you do a search for housing, it's gone from 2024 down to 2015, 2012, all different types of, of housing related studies, analysis reports. So it's all there. Uh, and on that is RKG's report that was done for PHA. On there is the Rockingham um, planning uh, and the housing studies, statewide housing studies, uh, everywhere. So, yeah, it's a resource. So, um, housing studies by way of 1% vacancy by way of what's driving this. And let's take a quick look at what's worked and, and what seems to be good policy solutions. Because these shape our, our work program. Um, <clears throat> we've been able to use density bonuses, Cinemagic, West End Yards. Small, but successes. Uh, the biggest success, 40% of the affordable units were in the Court Street project, Court's Thousand Historic project. And I would urge all of you to go stop by there, see what it's like. Um, in the 
you know, we we uh, are also under Council Monroe's leadership, uh, creating some gateway district zoning that's much more flexible, um, much more mixed use. The gateway zoning technically has been around since 2017. We're expanding right. the areas that are covered by gateway. I just didn't want that to be misleading. <laughs> but, but many of the, the solutions that came out of the study <laughs> circles and were discussed there, micro units, shared quarters downtown, more boarding house type things that you see in college community, um, density in neighborhoods like duplexes and triplexes, which are part of the city landscape, yes. say on Cabot Street. Yeah, yeah, you can't walk down Rich. I mean, Richard. I think that whole neck of the 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 city, from like Richards, Cabot, Middle Union, everything basically. There was all these old homes for duplexes, triplexes. Um, but we have seen in, in recent, very recent, um, as in like the Sagamore uh, on Sagamore Ave, which is a single family ranch that was. You know, a plan was brought to the planning board and said, no, this is single family zone, but directly across the street, we have a condominium um, neighborhood and the yeah, other side of the street, the we have the apartments. Yeah. And yeah. so, again, looking at that from a more holistic view of how do we get to a reasonable yes? And I really would like that to be a takeaway from this com from this committee is how do we get to a reasonable yes? Well, and I, I think that, you know, yes, the neighborhoods are important. And I think... You know, for instance, when you talk about the Court Street, I mean, that is a location in town that is right for that type of building. Yeah, it's great for density. Great, great for density, great there. You know, I, I use the example, you know, we talk about city properties. That pro that type of a de development wouldn't work at Cloud Field. I mean, so you have to look at what, you know, what the name... You want to make sure that you're making, you know, you're, you're fitting in to the neighborhood and not being an outlier. Okay. And that's where our where can density, and that will be some of the sort of air. Just, yeah. John made a statement that 40% of Moose Place is workforce. And does that mean that? No, no, it's 40% no, of the units that have been developed since 2015. It's 167 affordable units. That we've created in the last seven years. The entire city, 40% of yeah. it was in the city, just that building. Oh, just that represents 100% yeah. of the building. Right, 100% <laughs> of the building. And I'll just put two quotes uh, from the next slides because I think you all had a chance to read them. Yeah. I've been staying in a friend's room, guest room after my apartment in Portsmouth, where I had lived for almost five years, incre increased rent by 600 a month to match market. That's happening all the time. All of them. And then um, I've been working towards home ownership, but have John, to move. John, can I just pick up on that for a second? Yeah. One yeah. second, though, John. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in those situations, some of those buildings get sold. The person who buys the house and has the apartment now has to pay off and they and they paid big bucks for that facility. So I, you know, it, it's not that people are trying to, you know, gouge their renters. In a lot of cases, when they buy the property, they've got to make pay, the, the payments on those, and they have to charge those types of rents in order to justify. And 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 part of the conversation we have when we really start diving into affordable and what we can do in the city, besides developing new units, is working with the smaller. Uh, landlords to see what we can do without increasing tax burden to other taxpayers. We know that there, I mean, I, I lived in an apartment on Cash Street for years that was $1,400 for two and a half bedrooms, and it's still $1,400. It just gets passed from friend to friend to friend. So we want to make sure we're also trying to find ways to creatively incentivize local landlords and small landlords and people that have owned buildings forever to keep them at lower. But again, Figuring out creative solutions in this room and in our community without passing on the burden to everyone else. So figuring out. Yeah. One of the things we could also look at yeah. is allowing people to have two ADUs. One of them is yeah. always affordable. Oh, yeah. yes. Okay. So uh, not not to skip quotes because these are beautiful, but we are. I'm going to skip <laughs> to the big question: the what is affordable definition? This is a constant conversation that it's, it's had on the council level, individual level. 
what is affordable. And I think it's very important to know inside this group and outside this group, we do not define what is affordable. The state and the RSA, mm -hmm. and as you go higher into, there's, there's the kind of the federal um, numbers too. But here you can see uh, to rent the New Hampshire R RSA is affordable. It's 80% of the median, which is a two person household income of $100,000. Um, and that's a U.S. census. Um, and then for rent, it is 30% uh, of income equals $2,000. Uh, $50 for a two-bedroom apartment. Um, actual is is $2,500. So I, again, I think it's if important. Not if not higher, I yeah. think it's important when we talk about um, affordability to to discuss our median income of our uh, for again a, a two-person household in our community. And that's the workforce housing definition. You know, there are other definitions of affordable housing for 60% of median income. But you know, these are people who are disabled can't work um, and we have historically done a pretty good job of taking care of them um, certainly better than our surrounding communities but there is i think i for my for my money our, our, our effort and our focus should be on that that person making the median of 80 percent and i think you know one of the conversations that i've been chiming here as, as the person who's been in the service industry in this town for now 15 years, um, I want to make sure when we talk, there's constantly, I think this narrative put out that like, no waitress can afford that. Like, you know, I, I think we have to make sure that we are respecting people's wage levels and, you know, $50,000 for a, um, you know, for a teacher, for a full-time service worker, things like that. Those are achievable numbers. So, so, you know, some of these things are achievable numbers for some of the people that I think Unfortunately, in our community and in these dialogue sessions get put as as bottom barrel, they don't make a livable wage. Because um, remember, they are factored in at the bottom. You know, the lowest of our incomes are factored into this. But I think it's, you know, as we talk about service people and people in the arts and things like that, as, which are constantly talked about in Portsmouth of keeping uh, the town vibrant, the reality of the town, the social economic climate. Uh, I just wanted to put that out there that, you know, you know, I have baristas that make close to that much because they're sure. working full time and, and they're so I, you know, we have to make sure that we are cognizant um, of, of that there are real people behind these numbers before as a community we we talk ill of, of certain demographics. Yeah, it's important to destigmatize that. I mean, your your personal finances that are not then it's not a one-to-one -one equation of your community value. Uh, and when we look at the econ economy of our city, I think the number was like 70 million was uh was, it was direct results of the arts. Art. So are the artists packing up their mules and coming into town to sell their wares and then being banished off? I mean, that's it's a servile community I don't think any of us want. Yeah, yeah and you know, a, a great example is I talked to somebody at Griffin and she's got a college degree, a master's degree. She's chosen to be a caregiver to kids at Seacoast Community Channel. And, you know, she says, who's going to take care of your kids? Um, who's going to uh, take care of you when you're in life at the pharmacy? All these jobs are vital. I mean, a lot of affordable housing to me is economic well-being and development. 100%. And our community is threatened if we don't fix this because eventually, uh, what's one of our biggest industries in Portsmouth? It's hospitality. It's tourists. And if we don't have people to work those jobs, then those businesses will shutter. And eventually, the homes, this was a point that I tried to make in the Portsmouth Listen session, we'll get to affordability eventually if we continue on our path, because everyone will leave. There won't be a reason to live here. But we also have to think about the fact is that in some cases, those are personal decisions. I mean, as John is saying, this person who has a college degree has chosen to a profession that doesn't pay a lot of money. I mean, that's a personal decision. But do we not value the work that she does? Then? We might value the work. Well, the, we value the work that they do. But are we supposed to subsidize somebody's personal decision? If they're contributing to the overall economy of the city, I would argue yes. Okay, and that's and these will be conversations we have in this group. Yeah, that's why you know, that's, yeah, that's why we have that discussion. Have that discussion. Yeah, that's why we have that. Or I just want to quickly yes. add a, a voice into this, and and that is when we're talking about rental, 
we're talking a lot about the people doing the renting. Uh, I want to just quickly add in the thought about the people providing the rental units. And as I prepared for the Places to Live um, dialogue, uh, I did some interviews with smaller scale, and Joanne, you mentioned the mom pop, um, people that provide a lot of the rental units in here. In, in, in brief, and a quick way to explain an example of why the rents are going up, is that when one person said, I've had this rental unit for 25 years, <coughs> this two family, um, when I first bought it, a stove was $200, it's now $800. So every time a tenant leaves and I need to do repairs or improvements or changes, I'm not charging $200. I'm not charged $200 for a place. It's $800. And Mechanical equipment. More importantly, when that person decides to sell, they're going to make a lot of money. And the next landlord has a much bigger mortgage yeah. and a much higher interest rate. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they can't, they can't both pay off that old Landlord. Well, I mean, money that they want, and then also still rent it. That's right. Nice. And like Joe was saying, we're talking about the, you know, Atlantic Heights. I was in real estate for a short period of time, and you had people who had lived in those apartments at, at you know, at the at the Heights for 15, 20 years, and had never gotten a, you know, a rent increase. Yeah. Um, but then that property gets sold. And as Jen is saying, that person pays real money for that property in order for them to just, yeah, know. you know, to yeah. pay their expenses. They have to, in some cases, increase the rate 300% because the rent 300% that's because that's what they need to pay off their mortgage. That's all part of the discussion. Uh, no. I want to make one last point and then we'll hit the last slide. Um, to buy, you know, Workforce housing is 100% of median. That gives somebody 2,500 a month to pay mortgage and insurance and tax. Um, we've got a median home price of $7,000. And the actual cost to carry that, to buy that house is 4266 per month. A huge gap. But so, the other piece that's missing here is the down payment. Right. Because these people who, you know, who are making the amount we're showing here, I can, and they're paying that in rent, they're not able to put money away they can't to take care of the down payment. You just gave right. me this great idea that if we can get these people into affordable rental units for a few years, then they can save up and have money for a down payment. What a novel idea. And if there's maybe a smaller square footage <laughs> to buy, that is a nice way of life. I think it's yeah. wild that we talk about 800 square foot, like it's a tiny house. Yeah, I mean, like that's the, why I always talk yeah, about the 1950s nice. stock houses were 800 square feet. That's right. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the, town, York, the, yeah. the classic GI Bill, those were 900 feet. Yeah. Well, it's it's also, maybe the Panaway. Yeah. We were, those we were, are, yeah. We, we were built as affordable what military was? housing at, at, you know, small three bedroom, one bath ranches at, at 900 square feet. Um, so, you know, I think that again, when we talk about purpose of this group in my world too, it's also to destigmatize all different types of housing. We, and that includes some of these higher end condos. I mean, my grandparents lived in a condo my whole childhood and I, nobody ever said anything bad about the fact that they lived in a condo association. And so again, we need to make sure we're destigmatizing housing on every single, platform and in every single social economic pressure point and, and area in in the you know I, what I don't want is for our community to be divided as in good housing and bad housing good neighbors and bad neighbors good community members and bad community members it's just different affordability and right now the market is here and we have a very unique a, a unique standpoint in time to fill in a little bit of that middle. We're not gonna solve housing, a housing crisis, we're in a national housing crisis. Uh, but what we can do and what I deem as a responsibility as my role as a city councilor is to do what I can for my immediate community. We'll discuss here and hopefully maybe have more discussions with other communities, but I cannot control that Newington does not wanna build anything. Oh. I cannot control that Rye does not wanna build. We cannot make Dover build, make Summersworth build, but we can do is what we can do within our narrow space of Portsmouth. 
So here's the challenge for us. Um, <laughs> the only one? Yeah. <laughs> right. But this is simple, right? Um, this is very complex. And I think that all our efforts in the past have been, well, process on. Let's let's dive into the zone. You know, and I think if we're gonna really move to some measurable success, I would submit to us that we should have a quantitative goal. Now, a goal for that middle income group uh, that's, that's at, say, at need, that can afford that $2,2500 month. And here's the historic trend that we just saw. We've only been able to create 24 units of that type of housing for sale or for rent per year. That's not helpful. Now, some of you might say we need 500 units. Um, Howard might say, well, you've got to permit it, you've got to change zoning in order to permit it can't do 500 in the next two years or three years. But I would say we sure got to do better than 24, right? So, um, you know, uh, this slide, I would like to take out, based on what John is saying, take out rental. A look, a blow market or middle income Units and they can be for sale or for rent. And so over the next two years, and I count anything that goes into Peter Britz's permitting process by the end of the second year. That may take another year, but I think that counts. Uh, so, you know, I just want to add to that, Joan, too. One of my aspirations uh, behind that number is it may be a little hidden. And if, if, if we're 200 units, one of the things that came out of the dialogue, and, uh, and again, it's one of my aspirations, it's just not about hitting the number. It's what that number is comprised of. And so it's, it's hitting, idea of getting to 200, it's just not 200 at 100% affordability. It, it could be 80%, 60%. It's about choices, and it's about hitting all those different income levels in terms of what people are earning in the workforce in Portsmouth. And you might say, well, 200, that sounds like we're chinning ourselves on the curve. That's so low. But it's eight times what our historic trend is. And I would say that is our homework, is um, to uh, internally within yourselves figure out kind of a number that you feel like you're comfortable with so then we'll meet in two in two weeks that we can we can kind of discuss that. well given our timeline we got only comment we got oh, yeah, comment. Yeah. 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 can i add yeah. something yes you know and joe you said it earlier i think one of the things that we have to take into consideration is we talk about affordable housing and we talk about rentals and purchase. How do we deal about with the current homeowners in Portsmouth? You know, many of us are in good situations that, you know, we are in positions where we can make an investment. But we also have people who have scraped together and just bought their first house. And I don't want to add, add a burden to them that will make their situation unaffordable. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about the fact is that when we talk about doing various things, there are economic impacts. And you know, it's nice to have a goal and say we want to do X number of units, but the question is at what cost? Well, let me, let me finish, yeah, please. And I think that that's one of the things that we have to take into consideration is the fact is that 
you know, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with one of the letters that was written during campaign time, but we need to think about people who are here and recognize that, you know, there are people who may not be in a situation where they're, they have the freedom to make an investment. And we need to think about that. It's just not across the board, so. Yeah, and I think that's gonna be part of the discussion and I'm glad that you're a voice on that. The housing authority does not require any of our taxpayers. They use federal tax credits. Um, and uh, the zoning changes would not require any taxpayer. So, but I, I would argue, I would argue that we also need to think about if, uh, you know, and I'll just bring it up. The Sherman School property is a $7 million piece of property. We need to think about, you know, how we protect the value of that for the current citizens. I think that um, if, if this group is meetable, I think Sherburn can be the lead topic of our next meeting in two weeks, and we can kind of hash out some of those conversations um, and you know really kind of start diving into that. Um, given that, is there any other comment within the group before I open up? We only have ten minutes left, and I want to. We have. I just want here. to make a quick statement about that. If if there's any questions about but you just referred to a Sherburn school. I'm just going to say, if there's any questions from a committee member where they want research done or something else to that effect, it doesn't need to be about Sherburn, but anything, is is the distribution of that question should go to the, the chairs and the chairs would then relay it to me. Sure. Um, and that way I can respond back. That's just the, the, the flow of information. That way we can be prepared well in advance of, of the next meeting. Perfect. So yeah, so any 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 staff questions that you're looking to get answered right there on the spot, please send to the chairs sure. and we will make sure that the staff is in line. Uh, any other? I would just hope to add a couple zeros to the 200. That seems like, <laughs> why are we here? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah. We can do way better than that. I'm sure I, we can. And I'd like to see it be something that's sustaining, not a one-time blink. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's going to take a... Mm -hmm. a a completely different way of looking at things, not just putting little band-aids here, but I think we can do a lot more. So I, I, I don't want to limit ourselves right out of the gate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure, sure. yeah. Yes, Eric. Um, PHA, no, PH, PHA housing, is yeah. that, can we can we um, put a parameters on that? Is, since it's federal dollars, is it open, is it inclusive to anybody? Yeah, so there's not just not we've had some discussions to say is it just going to be available for perhaps residents or to say, establish yeah, yeah speak kind of. to eligibility for their units depending on the type of money they use. Well, and I think the other thing too is before we get, I don't know if we're are we only talking to PHA. No, 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 so so we'll okay. discuss all of this at the next at the next meeting. Yes, I I just to answer your question at some point. If there are questions for PHA from this group, we'll invite them in here and they can, I don't want to represent an organization I'm not part of. So, and I don't want to speak for them. So when we have, you know, if the group has questions for them, we will invite them in. Um, and like any other thing with the staff, and, and if we invite any other speakers, I'd ask you to prepare some questions so that we can let them know, like, hey, here are some of the information you yeah. should make sure you bring. You said with some authority that the surrounding towns have no interest in this discussion. Is well, that, no, no, no. I think is, is, I want to just make sure I'm clear of what I what I what my statement was is that I cannot control what other municipalities do. I cannot have input. I I, I go to meetings in other there, communities. But has there been a reach out to those other communities to say, do you want to join into this effort? Oh, that's could be that could be part of the committee's work. Yes, I, I can tell you because I am the vice chair of the Rocky and Planning Commission that we've actually had housing discussions on a regional level, and there are very differing opinions. Of course. <laughs> right, that's it's right. Very, very right. tactful. Okay, so let, think, yeah, public comment. Let's go to public comment. And if you're on Zoom and you wish to speak during public Please comment, raise your hand. hand. Raise your hand. We can see. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna keep it as brief as possible. Yeah, so we're gonna two do minutes. two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, please come to this chair. Please state your name and the city that you live in. 
Gerald Duffy, uh, 428 Pleasant Street, Portsmouth. Um, I live in 800 square feet. Um, I've got renters on one side, public housing that pay 800 a month. A couple downstairs pays 3,000 in the middle, 3,000 a month. Live in a wonderful, diverse neighborhood. I wish that for everyone in Portsmouth. Um, i just like to make a pitch for uh, something in addition to what you're doing. I, I actually feel very excited, which is unusual for me to come to City Hall. Um, but this is this is really great. So um, seven years ago, the Ports of Listens group came to one of the conclusions they came to was that uh, mayors, uh, blue ribbon committees weren't enough right, to, to to address this problem. And they said we need we need uh, something uh, in addition. So that thing in addition is a task force approach, right? So and that is not that would not um, take away anything you do or or disparage the, the the goals that you're setting out here would be in addition. So task force, why a task force? Task force is about action. They can they can act quickly. They're outside of the committee structure. We saw that for COVID. Um, go outdoor dining in a matter of weeks. Um, so they can get things done. So what would the, the outcomes be? A couple of outcomes. One would be a portfolio of concepts for different housing types, right? Not not designs for specific buildings, but different housing types. Uh, Robert um, uh, White behind me can talk all about that. So things like cottage clusters, multifamily units um, that work in single family neighborhoods, courtyard configurations for residents who want to age in place. That interests me personally. My mother uh, was able to live to just short of 100, living in a U-shaped courtyard, which uh, encouraged people to check on their bedroom windows and allowed her to, to live independently until she was almost 100. I would love to have something like that, of course. Um, micro units for service workers and so on. So that would be the first deliverable. Second deliverable would be one or two flagship projects uh, with a special focus, say, on, uh, for public benefits or housing public employees or existing residents who might possibly be priced out in the future. Um, so example of, of the portfolio. So uh, one example would be um, service worker housing. So two years ago, Mark McNabb uh, made a presentation to the planning board, um, 11 point practical formula for service working, a uh, service, ser service worker housing downtown. So these would have been micro units, uh, maximized uh, use of small space, rent that would have included all utilities and broadband, and even a way to waive deposits, which is a huge entry barrier, right, uh, for workers who agreed to have rent deducted from their wages. It's a, it was a phenomenal plan. Uh, he listed 11 prerequisites that would make, so a template, which would make such a project work, requiring zoning compromises from the city, and financial compromises from the... Can you wrap it up, please? Yes. yes. Well, Sorry, Jeremy. We're we're getting, getting yeah, yeah, but I don't feel like we, we the public should be pinched um, uh, at the end of this, all right? We, we came, the public are here. Uh, you've had plenty to say. There's other people who'd like to Yes, speak. I know, but I would like to finish. If you okay. Don't you can I'll wrap up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't appreciate that. Uh, so uh, the project was approved by HDC Planning Board but it was turned down by the zoning board, uh, board of adjustment. So there could have been over, uh, I think over 60 service workers uh, living on Court Street, where we now have offices being built, uh, which, we, which we don't need. Uh, so a task force could con uh, consist of uh, also design professionals, uh, our talent for people like Robert White, Brian Murphy, developers who could be corporate citizens, McNabb, Eric Chinberg, people like Sarah Reitzman, uh, Andrea Pickett with knowledge of housing, and maybe Colby, uh, Colby Gamester for zoning knowledge. And how it's not. We need to wrap up. Um, so that's what a, a, a task was. So I, I would love it if you consider that approach as something in addition to what you do. Could you email Thank that to me? What was that? Could you email that to us? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Thanks, Jerry. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Next. I'm Jim Smalley, 352 Kearsarge Way. How's it going? Just a couple of thoughts and comments. Um, one, the fourth adopt a mission statement for the land use boards as well, the housing be affordable for all of them. You speak up a little, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Could um, Portsmouth adopt a mission statement so by the land use boards as well, that housing be affordable for all of them? That that be their framework? One of the things I've noticed. Tend to focus on targeted outcomes 
this sort of broad underlying uh, economic principle to drive in the artificial because of city mandated to artificially increase the cost. John, you mentioned the 1810 units that were approved. Um, how many units were proposed? And what's that difference? Uh, that's a good question. Right, so it's like a funnel loop thing. Like I think it's environments. That drip, drip, drip adds up to housing shortage mm -hmm. and increases costs. Um, what has the city done that contributes to the housing shortage? For example, why is Atlantic Heights a need? Why don't we start there? Right. Right. Um, let's see. PHA. PHA, it's just the way I look at it. Maybe no tax or dollar, dollars directly paid, but there is a cost the taxpayers pay. I apologize, we don't make it. So, but um, it's not a free lunch. There is no free lunch. And that's true in the incentives, too. Some of the incentives actually result in less housing. Built. And there's an economic position to this. I could go on and hopefully come back. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Eat with us in your heart. Sure. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Peter Somsich, uh, Sweat Avenue, Portsmouth. Um, I just have a couple. Uh, I want to confirm the fact that when PSH works with us on a collaboration of a project like the, the Court Street, they get that property, that city property, for free. So that property is no longer available for the city to reap any kind of financial revenue from it. That's our contribution as a city. The other part of it, the financing and so forth, that's right, they take care of it. There's no more taxpayer money involved. That's my understanding. Secondly, I noticed that we're talking now about Sherburn School as if there are no other options on the table. And I think the last time Sherburn School came into focus, there was an uproar in Panaway Manor about the neighbors not having any real say in this, and it was just railroaded they saw, they saw it as being railroaded over them. Again, now, I don't know if we've had any real discussions with the Panaway Manor neighborhood, and Eric could say that, and the others could mention it. I don't think it's happened, and now we're already focusing on that as if that's our, our um, operandus uh, right now. And as uh, Joe mentioned, we should make sure that people feel all, all the housing options are um, I'm not being discriminated against, but when, when that first proposal was made at Sherman School, a lot of people accused the Penway Manor neighborhood of being uh, NIMBYs, that they don't want that in their backyard, when in fact those houses are starter homes and they're a middle class neighborhood. And so, <laughs> so, so, so I, I think uh, we shouldn't be jumping into the conclusion that this is the only option. There are other options. And as John mentioned to or insinuated, Residents who live here, many of them for a long time, see that prop their home as their retirement. That's their retirement. And if you start changing the neighborhood in a way that decrease, depreciates the value or decreases the value of their homes, they look at it as a direct assault on their retirement. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Anyone else? Come on up. Sure. Hi. Hello. My, name is, my name is John Logan. I'm a relatively new uh, permanent resident of Portsmouth. And uh, affordable housing has been on my agenda for 50 years as uh, my whole adult life. And I'm really pleased to see that it's gotten to be uh, up on the agenda of the city, too. This is obviously a big problem. And I'm I'd like to thank all of you who are willing to serve on this committee with that concern in mind. So just as a resident, I'm really pleased that you're here thinking about it. Now, there's just one thing I'd like to say about the way that it's being approached. I, I understand uh, Councillor Tabor's notion that you can't go too high, too fast. You should have concrete, feasible goals figure out what you really can do 
And I personally think that if anything was done more than 24 units a year, that would be fantastic because that would be different and it would take an effort. On the other hand, I was very taken by Tracy's comment about how modest is the thinking here about what might possibly be done and what should be done. And in particular, I wanna just take the example of supposing that we were able to provide uh, uh, an unlimited amount of housing for people at the median income. And wouldn't that be a wonderful thing in terms of affordable housing? And I'd like to point out that that leaves out half, that leaves out half of the population of the county and the state. And it's the half that is the needy half. And, and I, I, I think that we should keep that in mind in terms of, we talk about, oh, if we can get housing for two or three thousand dollars a month, that would be really like a big deal. We need housing for five hundred dollars, for eight hundred dollars. We need low income family housing for people who just don't have anything. And that has to be part of the agenda. It can't be put in the framework of just saying we're going to provide affordable housing for the middle class. Well, who's against that? Right? That can be done. That's easy to do, but can we provide affordable housing for poor people who don't have it and who never could live here? They're living out there somewhere. Look, that's my point of view. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Anyone else? Last call. Okay. Oh, yes, Ben. I'll be far less than two minutes. From okay. Uh, ben Van Camp. I'm the president of the Chamber of Commerce here in Portsmouth, the Chamber of Five River. Parker Street. Um, I just want to uh, add a suggestion for you guys to consider, for y'all to consider. Um, we've seen a lot of interest around the state and here locally of businesses being part of the solution. Businesses are building housing for their employees. Uh, you know, something done back in the revolutionary age and, and it's coming back around to be a, a new fad. So something for this community to consider is how can the city better work with those businesses that are interested in providing housing for their employees? Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you all so much for public comment. Thank you to the committee. One of the things that I, yeah, I think that we should make sure that we do in this in this uh, committee is every few minutes maybe do a public dialogue session, uh, so that we're not talking at you and you're not talking at us, and we can have more of a dialogue session because we all are community members and we all care. Um, and so make sure that you know I'll talk to the chair. I've just agreed to it. He has agreed I'm to it here. Yeah. Um, and so we'll make sure that we do some more public dialogue sessions mixed in too, so that we're having full community kind of round to full conversations of this. Yes, sir. So the subject of the um, scribe or the note taker. Um, you volunteer? No. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. Is there an English major in the room? I am definitely not an English major. Me. Um, the Zoom meetings, Zoom has transcribing technology. I don't know if, if, if the city has gone down that path at all where, um, I mean, it's built for the software. So if these are all on Zoom, it's very straightforward to turn that on and that'll just get raw um, raw notes taken. And I think that would be a nice step. Um, pretty accurately, I'd be happy to take the Zoom output and produce minutes from those. All right, deal. Okay. Deal. Deal. Okay. Deal. 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 We will see you all in two weeks. Two weeks if you have any questions for uh, staff, uh, send them over to the chair. The chair, we'll get them with just an idea. An idea.